All right, good afternoon and welcome everybody. My name is Mike Eilon. I am the CEO of Greek University. We have a rather large crowd gathered here today for our event. I am so grateful that you're joining us today for this very important conversation. I have to say thank you to all of our small group facilitators. We have seven small group facilitators with us today that have volunteered their time this afternoon for the session. So thank you so much for helping us, as well as our outstanding panelists that will lead us in a discussion today on race, equity, inclusion, and religion in historically Jewish fraternities and sororities. Let me begin by telling you a little bit about our amazing panelists. Libby Anderson is the Chief Executive Officer for ZBT Fraternity. Libby is a graduate of the University of Missouri with a Bachelor of Education Studies in Family and Consumer Science Education and Indiana State University with a Master of Science degree in Student Affairs Administration. Prior to returning to ZBT, she was the Executive Director of Phi Kappa Sigma Fraternity. She was the first female Executive Director of a men's fraternity. Libby has served as the Assistant Executive Director of Zeta Beta Tau Fraternity, Director of Operations for Alpha Epsilon Pi Fraternity, Director of Greek Life at the University of Central Missouri, and Director of Greek Life at Mount Union College. Libby is a member of Alpha Epsilon Phi Sorority, where she served as National Vice President of Programming and on the AE Phi Foundation Board of Trustees as Secretary. She is also active in the Great Fraternal Community, where she has served as director of the Association of Fraternity and Sorority Advisors Foundation, a lead facilitator for programs of the North American Interfraternity Conference, member of the Fraternity and Sorority Assessment Coalition Project, and a volunteer for the Circle of Sisterhood. Lawrence Bolitan joined AJC Chicago as regional director after nearly 14 years at CBT International Fraternity. A graduate of the prestigious 18-month 18, 18 Schusterman Foundation Fellowship for Jewish Professionals, he has served the Junior Chamber International as National President for the United States in 2016 and Global Treasurer in 2017. He was a board member of Hillel at Indiana University, served on the board of the Jewish Student Connection. Lawrence, a graduate of the Spurtis Institute for Jewish Leadership, received his undergraduate degree in public relations from the University of Florida and his master's in higher education administration from the University of Texas at Austin. Alista Gorenberg is the treasurer of the Delta Phi Epsilon National Housing Corporation and the co-lead advisor for the Delta Eta chapter at the University of Michigan. During her time in undergraduate at the University of Michigan, she held several roles within the Delta Eta chapter as well as on the Panhellenic Executive Board. She currently works as a program manager for Moishi House, a global organization helping young adults build community through Jewish peer-led experiences. Finally, last but not least, of course, Alexander Tate. He will be a December 2020 graduate of the University of Memphis with a Bachelor's of Business Administration in Accounting and Finance. Alex was the chapter president at the Gamma Mu chapter of ZBT from December 2018 through January 2020. He also served as orientation guide and the executive director of the Sexual Assault Prevention and Awareness Coalition on campus. He was also served as uh, the intern in the Tennessee legislature recently. So if anyone has any open positions that Alex is a good fit for going forward, please let me know. I will put you in touch with an outstanding soon to be graduate. And of course, we'll say hello to his proud father, Anthony, and also Mayor Ash, who are watching in their hometown of Lebanon, Tennessee today. So thank you so much to all of our panelists. Thank you so much to all of our attendees. Let's get started with some questions to open things up here for our panelists. The first question that I have is, uh, you know, basically all of our panelists here, they're all members of historically Jewish fraternities and sororities. I happen to be Jewish, I happen to be Israeli and a fraternity man, but not from a historically Jewish fraternity. I have seen policies of non-sectarian membership. I've also seen great value placed on the diversity of membership. I see that it is the character of the men and the women that you are looking for in terms of recruitment, not the religion, the race, or the creed. Now, some might argue that the Jewish history and the Jewish membership is important to preserve. So my question is, can we do both? Can we 
honor the Jewish history and also at the same time have diverse membership. So Alex, I was wondering as an undergraduate, I think your opinion here is so important. Your voice is critical. Do you think that we can do both, Alex? Make sure you take the uh, mute off. One second. My apologies. Sorry That's all right. That. You got it. <laughs> um, I think that it's not only possible, but that it is currently happening at a lot of CPT chapters uh, right now. Um, I know that uh, the method that our chapter uses um, is that we don't typically vet recruits based on our Jewish heritage, but we allow for our recruits to vet us based on their perspective of that. Um, we are a primarily non-Jewish chapter. I think that we recently got our first Jewish member in a couple of years. Um, but our, our goal is that we definitely put our heritage in the forefront of the information that we give the people that we're recruiting, as well as um, we very much so advertise our ties to the Jewish community here in Memphis. Uh, we do several community service events every year uh, with the Jewish Community Center, and we try to connect with our local Hillel as much as possible. Um, but we don't make that in the forefront of how we recruit our members. We allow for them to make that decision for themselves. That's fantastic. Lawrence, what do you think about uh, this question? Same question to you. Can we preserve the Jewish history, but also have diverse membership at the same time? Thanks, Michael, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for having me as part of the panel. For this question, I believe strongly that the Jewish history and membership is absolutely important to preserve. And let me tell you a little bit about why. As, as Michael mentioned, I work for the American Jewish Committee and lead their efforts in the Chicago land area. Last year, AJC released the results of a landmark survey of American Jews on anti-Semitism in the United States. Among the many troubling statistics that we saw as part of that survey, we found that nearly 40% of 18 to 29 year olds have avoided publicly wearing, carrying, or displaying things that may identify them as Jewish out of concern for their safety or comfort. 40% of 18 to 29 year olds represent many college students. In addition to that, we saw with the march in Charlottesville about three years ago, uh, what we once thought was inconceivable to see in the United States in the current day play out right before our very eyes, as we saw far right-wing neo-Nazis chanting, amongst many things, Jews will not replace us. Since then, we've seen violent and deadly attacks in Pittsburgh, in Poway, in Jersey City, in Muncie, against Jews simply for being Jews, and the list goes on. So Jewish fraternities and sororities may be more relevant now than perhaps ever before. That all being said though, there is clearly value in diversity and bringing together good men and women of all backgrounds to learn from one another, break down barriers, break down stereotypes, are all things that Jewish fraternities and sororities can do while still maintaining strong Jewish identities while being open to all people of good conscience. Thank you so much. That's a really, really great points that you've shared with us here. Now, the interesting thing, I think, for all the organizations that we're talking about here, your organizations have successfully blended your membership of various faiths. So I'm wondering, how was this achieved? Alyssa, let us know from a DeFi-E, from your perspective, how were you able to achieve this blending of membership? Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, thank you very much for having me, and I'm really um, excited that all of you are here to engage in this really important discussion with all of us. Um, I think something that's really beautiful and important and always celebrated in DeFi's history is that while we were founded by five Jewish women a little over 100 years ago um, at NYU Law School, the intention was to find an organization that was truly welcoming of all people. Um, you know, Jewish women were not able to join a vast majority of organizations, but our founders really wanted to create a space that was welcoming for all, you know, not just themselves. Um, and it's, it's really um, wonderful that that mission and that intention has held true and that DeFi still prides itself on being a non-sectarian and one of the first non-sectarian organizations. 
Um, and it's definitely not easy and the work is never done. That is for sure. Um, I can say, you know, from a chapter level, right, it's all about recruiting diverse membership. So I came from a chapter with well over 200 women and I didn't just get to think about who I would want to be friends with in the next membership class when we were recruiting, right? I had to think about women that would fit in with all of the women in my chapter. And, you know, just because I may not see myself being best buddies with them or that I find a clone of me in the next pledge class, right? Um, all women have a place at DeFi and it's important that I think about, you know, my, my friends a little and, you know, the, the lineage that I'm also very close with when recruiting. You know, additionally, I think our headquarters has done a really wonderful job of ensuring that our staff and our board members and the leadership consultants that we hire um, are very diverse. Um, you know, race, faith, we, we try to have it all. And I think that women also want to join an organization where they see other women like them. And I think we have a really um, wide array of people that, you know, you may see someone just like you. Fantastic. Libby, what do you think from ZBT's perspective, how has your organization be able, have been able to blend membership from various faiths? Let's make sure that we get the mute off. Hold on a second. Sorry, sorry That's about that. Um, it should know that when I talk, it should just start. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, we became non sectarian in 1954. And with that, you know, it's our pursuit to have brothers or, that are all men of good character. And, you know, time, like 1954 till now, that has been a long journey. Um, but within ZBT, <clears throat> we have a variety of talented men that represent many different faiths, while not forgetting about our Jewish roots and our founding and um, and that and what has shaped our organization. Um, earlier, Alex was talking about how their chapter doesn't have a lot of Jewish members in it, but their chapter is so engaged in the Jewish community that um, they the things that they do, they've been awarded for their commitment to the Jewish community in Memphis. And, and I think that's one of the things is that you wanna have a good community of men, but not forget the founding and always have that founding be a central focus in the organization because we're here because of our founders and have they created a legacy that we continue um, and it's our job to continue that and um, and I think when you're when you're looking at leadership you're looking for people that um, that are the best person for the job and when you have a community that is so open and that is so um, really just wanting to find the best people in the organization that really helps blend um, those different backgrounds and religions and which makes ZBT as special as it is because we rep represent so many different people while being um, loyal to our roots. I love it. I love it. So there are many fraternity and sorority rituals that might not be well understood by people who are outside of the Greek system. Um, and there are fraternities and sororities out there that have Christian roots, for example. Um, and then here we're talking with historically Jewish organizations. So what do you say about rituals that may actually be somewhat antiquated and possibly even offensive to people of different religions, race, or creed? And what advice do you have to bring change to the organization when it's needed? So Alyssa, I was wondering, what should you do if you're in that kind of a situation? Yeah. Um, you know, fraternities and sororities have existed for almost 250 years at this point. Um, it's a really beautiful tradition and also we're bound to have outdated practices and rituals and um, I really believe that no one should be married to tradition just for the sake of tradition, right? Like we want to be doing rituals and practices that really reaffirm our membership and make us feel great about it. That being said, when I was chapter president at DeFi, um, I definitely remember feeling uncomfortable by some of the rituals that we had. And, you know, I'm a Jewish woman at an organization founded by Jewish women. Um, and it, it can really happen to anyone, no matter what organization you're in. And I wish that someone had um, 
told me that these feelings were, were okay, that they're important to have, and that also I have um, an ability to make real change, right? So now I serve it, you know, in the organization in a different way where I'm a board member, and I want to be hearing from the undergraduates about what I can do as a board member to make their experience better. Um, DFI also has a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee that's been meeting for a few years now, and they would love to hear from undergrads and from alum about what we could be doing better to make real change. Um, we have a, we have Grand Chapter coming up later this month, and that's a really awesome time to, um, you know, contact the board and talk to them about making changes to our bylaws and what that process looks like. Um, I also would say that you can make those changes at the, the ground level, right? Like, look into your chapter's bylaws and see what your chapter's bylaws say about inclusive membership, inclusive practices, inclusive rituals, um, and talk to your leadership team or your executive board about what you can do on the ground level to make change as well. I'm so happy you said that, Alyssa, because I think for all the people who are listening now live and recorded after the fact, I think just being able to open up those conversations and make sure that our members feel comfortable having those conversations and thinking about inclusivity when we think about ritual and our ceremonies is so important that we can talk about these things. Um, so I think that's great. Lawrence, what do you think about uh, rituals that might be antiquated um, and what advice do you have to bring change when it's needed? It's a great question and there was so many different things that, that came through my mind. I'll try to limit this to just a couple of things for purposes of time. Certainly, I believe there are things that change over time and that it is fair and appropriate to engage in dialogue about our rituals, about our traditions as Greek organizations. We also can't forget the importance of explaining rituals to our members. How many times have we had an initiation ritual, a big brother, big sister ritual, a graduation ritual, uh, or we took in a class of new members, but we never took the time to actually revisit the experience after the ceremony part of it was, was done. I remember my experience when I was initiated in January of 1998, and I wasn't listening to the words. I was sitting there wondering, why am I sitting in the dark? Why are people wearing robes? What's get, like, what is happening right now? I wasn't familiar with what goes on in initiation ceremonies, and I missed all of the words because I was sitting there so uh, worried because of things I saw on TV or movies. Luckily, none, none of that happened. Um, but I'm sitting there realizing that uh, I didn't know what I just experienced. And then the very next time that I heard those words or had the chance to hear those words was fall of 1998 when we initiated the next class five months later. So we're missing a huge opportunity there to explain what's happening in ritual so that our members can actually understand if they're comfortable or not comfortable with the words that are being shared in the traditions of the organization. Times change. And while core basic teachings, hopefully, in many organizations remain the same, assuming that they are good values, good rituals that should remain the same. Uh, but I think it's also certainly fair to revisit them from time to time. Uh, it's important that we are able to also maintain history for the purposes of being able to teach both the good aspects of the history of our organizations, but also to maintain history in a way to educate and teach why we may have stopped traditions that were bad so that we don't worry about them coming back into our organizations. Those are equally as important that individuals understand um, why certain things aren't happening anymore. Yeah, I love revisiting the ritual. I think that's so important. I remember myself going through it and just being so caught up in the excitement of all of it. You don't really have time to process what it is that you're seeing. So uh, I think that's great if uh, chapters are able to revisit that and really explain the importance of it. Um, so what processes do we have in place to make sure that during recruitment, potential members are not judged based on religion, race, or creed? I was wondering, what do you think, Alex, about that? Oh, make sure you take that mute off. <laughs> That's twice now. I, I won't right. forget. <laughs> um, so in my chapter, um, I'd say that since I was a sophomore, I've definitely taken a lead in the recruitment department. And so I would say that I'm relatively responsible for a large portion of the chapter that's come in um, since then. <clears throat> and... I think that my focus that I've tried to shift to the fraternity and tried to influence on people was that um, what matters is that you have dedication to make your life better, but also all of your brother's lives better. Um, and so trying to shift the focus away from 
well, you know, he has to look like this. He has to like, he has to have these certain standards of, well, you know, he has to look good. He has to dress good. He has to be social. He has to have great grades. Um, and obviously some of those things are important things, <clears throat> but if you can, I feel if chapters are able to put some of those superficial things aside um, where it seems like it's more of putting emphasis on differences that you may have with people that may be interested in rushing to your chapter. Um, I feel like you can really focus on what's important, um, which is finding people who are willing to contribute greatly to a larger group. Um, and I find that those members are typically the best members, the ones that are willing to sacrifice a little bit, the people who are maybe not as motivated in class, but they know that they have to make this GPA so that they can stay in the chapter, or the people who might not have a whole lot of money, but they're going to try to pick up an extra part-time job so that they can stay in the chapter. People who don't have a whole lot of time, but they make time to go to the events and go to meetings and to spend time with their brothers and to really like encapsulate themselves into becoming a family. Um, and so I feel like that was probably a very roundabout way of answering the question. Um, <laughs> but essentially it, it's mainly about trying to take away the superficial like conceptions that a fraternity has and focusing on what's important to and further improve the brotherhood and further improve the individuals that are coming in. Yeah, it sounds like your chapter has successfully made that switch to what we would call values-based recruitment uh, in the industry and really focusing in on those values rather than a person's haircut or what high school they went to, for example, right? Superficial things. Um, Libby, I'm curious your thoughts on this. What processes do we have in place to make sure that potential members are not judged on religion, race, or creed? Simple. We recruit men of good character. That's it. And I think that, you know, and, and you were talking about Alex's chapter. Yes, they are a completely values-based chapter and, and excel. And, and, you know, when you recruit for men of good character, you, you talk about the fraternity experience and recruitment. You share what ZBT is about and what that means. Um, and, and for us, you know, finding those men of good character that can support our values our Jewish values, which are good people values, um, people, you know, gravitate to that. And, um, and just by being good stewards of the fraternity, good members of the fraternity, and, and, and being those values-driven individuals, those values-driven brothers, that's the best way to recruit all good men, um, not just specific good. Yeah, you're so right. Uh, the Jewish values are just good people values. That needs to be stressed. And no matter who you are, no matter what religion you're from, these are things that all people look at and say, yeah, that makes sense. That's me, right? And that's really all we're looking for, whether it be the University of Memphis or any chapter around the country. Um, so I absolutely love that. That's really, really good. Um, so here's the next question. What advice can you offer undergraduate members that are struggling with diversity in their organization? Because sometimes it's difficult for students to look for potential new members outside of their immediate friend group or maybe places that we've traditionally looked for new members. So Alex, where can we go for chapters that might be struggling in terms of diversity? What should they be doing? Where should they be looking? Um, so. <clears throat> from my chapter's perspective um i really try to push that we're not looking for more guys that are the same we're looking for more guys so that we can have a more well-rounded group and it doesn't really matter how big your chapter is it can be 200 men women um otherwise uh you're not going to be completely well-rounded you're not going to have <clears throat> you're not going to have every kind of person in your chapter and that's what you should strive to be able to do even if it's a uh, fruitless pursuit um, that's primarily what i try to push and that's how i try to you know send my members out into the world to try to <clears throat> not just recruit people who are different but to get to know people who are different because one always leads to the other very easily and it's a translatable skill in life uh, to gain better perspective um, and to understand the world better. Uh, it's pretty much the quickest and easiest way to just get to know people who are very different from you. And so <clears throat> that's the approach that I've 
personally tried to take with our chapter. It's so great to hear that from you, Alex, because really what we're teaching is the skills to build successful companies when you're done with college, after graduation. It's the same principles that we're teaching, that we need that diversity within our organizations. Um, so, Alyssa, what do you think about this? What advice could you offer an undergraduate chapter that might be struggling with diversity in their organization? Yeah, um, you know, this is something that I think, you know, the chapter that I advise is, is something that we're always talking about and we always want to improve. Um, you know, when we had our first round of continuous open bidding last fall um, and we had to re recruit for new members in a little bit more of an untraditional manner, you know, on University of Michigan's big campus, which has the big recruitment scene, um, you know, I encourage the women to Think about the other organizations um, that they're involved in on campus, right? Things like Dance Marathon and Relay for Life, um, your on-campus job, you're really in a whole new new group of people usually. And so look, in, look at the unaffiliated members in those places and see if you can kind of sweet talk them about the fraternity and sorority life experience and show them that um, you are a chapter that welcomes all folks. Um, something else that I would encourage chapters to think about is what kinds of programming is taking place in your chapter year round um, and how are you talking about that during recruitment. So one of the most wonderful memories that I had uh, in my undergraduate experience was being able to celebrate the Jewish holiday of Passover with all of my sisters in the house and it's really incredible that you know, our advisors and my house director took, um, you know, Passover and the Jewish holiday seriously enough to create a space that we were able to celebrate all together. And we should be doing the same for all sisters faiths in their holidays too. Um, and talking about all of that during recruitment, right? How wonderful is it that I get to finally learn about Easter from my sisters and help them celebrate a holiday that is really important to me. And how can I talk about that during recruitment as well? That automatically makes other people feel more welcome because they see that, you know, we want to celebrate all holidays. We want to celebrate all of our sisters. Um, something else that I know is becoming a larger conversation in the fraternity and sorority life community is financial accessibility, right? So how can we talk about financial accessibility within our, our chapters? Um, how do we make membership feel more feasible? Um, you know, let's be more open to talking about payment plans and different kinds of dues systems methods um, in order to make sure that you know there are as few barriers as possible um, to someone joining a fraternity or sorority life organization um, and then I think the last thing is you know when it comes to reaching out to those non-affiliated members that you you may know on your campus um, ask them pretty candidly you know why wasn't fraternity and sorority life for you why why was my chapter maybe not right for you and those are really hard conversations to have um, but I think you might find some really eye-opening um, perspective um, and also an opportunity to shut down false narratives, right? Um, let's all be really good ambassadors for our organization and the FSL community. And let's have these conversations that really kind of push our button in an uncomfortable way. I love your message, Alyssa. It's really that we need to be having authentic conversations. And I think for recruitment, there's nothing more important than that, right? Forget all the superficial stuff, forget the glitter, forget all of that, just be authentic. And that's what people are craving. It's those real relationships. So the next question is, how do we encourage non-Jewish members to run for leadership positions, whether it be locally or on a national level? How do we encourage them? Livia, I was curious your thoughts on that. Well, first, you know, sh we need to share with them that they have the qualities of good leaders. And so um, people, you know, they come into their leadership on their own, but they also need their cheering section. They need the people that believe in them. They need the people that invest in them to help them excel as leaders and invest as leaders. And so um, you, you got to tell them, you know, you've got to tell them that I value you as a person and as a leader. And I think that you can do some great things for our organization, whether that's locally or nationally. Or even, you know, I get really excited when I meet a, a undergraduate brother and, um, and you can see in their freshman year, this person is going to go all the way. And I, you know, there's a couple that I'm like, well, I'll see them on the Supreme Council, um, you know, 20 years down the line, or maybe in two years, because we actually have undergraduates on our Supreme Council. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and it, it's starting with that conversation. And, and let me tell you about the opportunities that are out there and, and how I think you bring a voice and a talent and a perspective to a very important 
um, board and we want to we want to invest in you and see how we can do that. I think every one of us that have experienced leadership roles, someone invested in us. Someone said, I believe in you and we have to do the same thing. And, um, and I know oftentimes when you're in an organization, you'll think, oh, I'm not the type of person that they're looking for. And there's not a type because leaders come in all um, shapes, sizes, and packages. And so it's helping them understand that what you see in front of you um, are the leaders that we have right now. But I need you to start thinking about what the leader you want to be and how you want to lead our organization, whether that's as a chapter leader or as a national volunteer in a national and not just have it be a one-time conversation. Because if you're gonna invest in them, you're gonna invest in their cultivation and invest in their development. It's so true. Your belief in them by just saying to them, I see you as a member of our grand council or whatever, that means so much because suddenly they see themselves in a different light. And if it's coming from you as a leader in the organization, it means that much more, right? So I love that. Alex, how do you encourage some of your members to run for leadership positions, let's say locally within your chapter or maybe within the IFC? How do you encourage them? Um, it is a lot of uh, what Libby actually just said. Um, uh, as an older member, well, as now an alumni, but the past couple of years being an older member, uh, I find that a lot of um, young men that are coming into college, uh, they haven't really had the opportunity to lead anything. And so they just automatically think that they're not good at it. Um, and I think that small words really go a long way in those situations. Um, I would say out of our eight exec board members that are there this year, I think that I personally had a conversation with all of them about running for the executive board, whether it was this past year or the year before. And really, it's just um, reinvesting into um, the younger members the way that the older members invested into me slash us. Um, I remember I had really no intention of running for any executive board decision or position uh, when I came into school. And after I've been in the chapter for a year, the president then, his name is uh, Louis Bobo. He's actually my grand big. Um, he told me that I would be a good uh, recruitment director. And that was something that I never really expected to hear from anyone, <laughs> to be completely honest. Um, I thought that I was like a decent recruiter, but I didn't think that anyone cared enough about what I had to say to be on the exec board. And, you know, two and a half years later, <clears throat> here I am. Uh, and so <clears throat> it's, it's the small things that go a long way. Um, interpersonally, uh, making sure that people have the confidence to run for positions, because I often do find that the people who don't necessarily want positions of power are oftentimes the best people to be in those positions. Um, and so, <clears throat> yeah, uh, like I said three times already, um, it's really about just encouraging those younger than you, especially those that may not feel like their voice is ready to be heard. That's perfect. I'm curious what you think about your Jewish founders. What, what do you think they would be thinking about how your organization has evolved since its founding? What do you think about that, Lawrence? In 2006, uh, that was the first time that I went to visit our founder, Professor Gotthaus Grave, uh, outside of New York City. And I brought a brand new staff member with me at the time when I was working at ZBT. And I posed the question, would he be proud? And it was a question that I had posed to many staff after that and still something that I think about today. And I, I do believe that our founders would be proud of the way that our organizations, traditional Jewish fraternities and sororities are now largely accepted as part of the community on campuses all over the country. There may be some exceptions where they don't quite feel as much part of a community, but for the most part, they are. I also think that they would be equally proud of the way that our organizations have remained connected um, when it comes to the Jewish community and the way that we continue to educate our brothers and sisters about the reason for our founding, the importance of our founding. I also think that they would be concerned. Uh, I think that they would be concerned with what they are seeing when it comes to not only the rise of anti-Semitism on college campuses, but also all forms of hate. 
when I was working at DBT, we created a campaign called Hate Against One is Hate Against All, which is something that still continues there today. If we expect people to stand by our side, then we best be ready to stand by their side too. And I would certainly hope that our founders would agree. That's an excellent answer and a very honest one. And I appreciate that honesty. I think that's so important. Um, I guess, you know, same question uh, to Alyssa. What do you think? Do you think our Jewish founders, they would be proud about where we are as an organization and how we've evolved? Yeah, I, I think about this question a lot, um, in particular in this in this moment um, as it pertains to DeFi, because the values that we were founded on are justice, sisterhood, and love. And I think that our founders would be incredibly proud to know that all of our um chapters, all of our alumni associations, the organization as a whole is always fighting for justice, sisterhood, and love, and recruit members who also share those values. Um, so they would be proud to know that those traditions really um, continue to exist. And I also think that they acknowledge that we have to wake up every morning willing to admit that the work is never over. It's certainly not over now. We have a lot of more work to um, and also, you know, something that I always talked about in undergrad is the intention of a sorority experience in my mind was I want to be surrounded by a group of women who will hold me accountable to be a better person and to be a better sister and to be a better leader in this world. Um, and I hope others are in, you know, a fraternity or sorority for the same, same reasons. Um, and so I personally have to talk about how my work is never done. And so, um, yeah, I think I think our founders would be really prideful and also know that we have a, a lot of a lot of things to do. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right on all accounts there. Um, so the next question, are there partnering opportunities that you see between historically Jewish fraternities and sororities and let's say historically black fraternities and sororities? Lawrence, you've obviously been involved for a very long time on a national level. Do we have those partnering opportunities available? 100% there are partnership opportunities available. Like any other partnership, uh, you have to have more than one person come to the table. And I think over time, there's been challenges on, on both ends. Uh, it's certainly something that, that we continue to strive for. I also think that, that extends to any marginalized community, whether that be looking at Jewish fraternities and sororities, Black fraternities and sororities, uh, member organizations of NALFO, of any of the other multicultural Greek organizations. Campuses are seeing tremendous growth in many of these organizations at least the last statistic I saw, many of which were founded to be able to provide more opportunities for leadership to be able to serve their communities. And regarding specific collaboration with historically black fraternities and sororities, honestly, I wish there was more. Um, I was just, prior to this conversation, I was on a call with a member of Congress here in Illinois, and he said specifically, when talking about black Jewish relations, this is as good a time as any to revitalize these, these relationships. And he was talking about how proud he is to be part of it. And I, it was interesting that he used the word revitalize. Uh, many will, will cite the examples of the Jewish community standing side by side with the black community doing, during the civil rights movement. And you'll also hear people say that those communities have since drifted apart. I don't know that that's a fact that those communities have drifted apart. People may believe that because they hear more people saying that, but we have so many examples to be proud of of the way that both communities continue to work together everywhere from Jewish fraternities and sororities and black fraternities and sororities to the black Jewish congressional caucus that was relaunched last year uh, with the involvement of AJC and, and so many other examples that are taking place on campuses as it relates to the fight against hate and how we can come together to address the needs of many. So there's absolutely partnership, uh, partnership opportunities and there's always opportunities for more. Yeah, I love it. Libby, what do you think about that? Is there any partnering opportunities that you see between historically Jewish fraternities and sororities and historically Black fraternities and sororities? I think you just go to our campuses, you see them on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. I think oftentimes our chapters are doing a great deal um, a partnership and doing probably more partnership than maybe the national organizations are and um, the national organizations are you know we collaborate but we're still developing different things where on our college campuses we see our students put that into action and they put it into action every day and um, and I think that that is where we can we can learn from our younger members because there are no barriers Mm -hmm. um, and they, you know, they, they collaborate, they work together, they um, have a common goal, whether it's educational or it's social or philanthropic on their campus, but you see it on a daily basis. 
I think that, um, of course, there's more opportunities. Can we be doing more? Yes, very much so. Um, I was glad that Lawrence brought up the, um, the caucus that AJC started because we, we are very lucky that we get to participate in that. And I was hoping that he would bring it up. So thank you, Lawrence. Um, because I really think that there are some really special opportunities out there for our leaders to participate in um, and to take that back to their chapters. Um, but I also think that we need to hold each other accountable to be better and do more. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. Um, now, in light of what's happening right now in terms of racial injustice happening in our country today, I was curious, what is the role of members of historically Jewish organizations when we see those examples of racial injustice happening on a regular basis in this country? What do you think about that, Alex? <clears throat> so I think that it's important for us in our role to never put distance between those issues and our organization uh, because at our very, or at least at ZBT's very roots, um, it was a way for Jewish men to be able to find a brotherhood where they were previously denied it. And I find that in those roots, there is commonality between the situations of Jewish men and women, as well as black men and women, as well as um, all people of color. Um, and so if there is an amount of uncomfortable, uncomfortableness, uncomfortability um, with individuals um, in Jewish organizations with dealing with those issues, uh, I feel like that's maybe them not necessarily being able to have the context as well as they could. And I think that <clears throat> it's our duty to not only educate, uh, to assist in educating the world, but also um, the members of our uh, respective or organizations. Um, it doesn't make a lot of, it doesn't make much sense for us to be a part of an organization that is for an oppressed minority group. Um, and also for us to not stand by other oppressed minority groups. 100% agree. Uh, Lawrence, I'm, I'm curious on your take on this. What is the role of members of historically Jewish organizations when we see these examples of racial injustice happening? I'm glad you asked. There's, there's a big role. And some of the things that come to mind is don't be silent. Uh, we see that far too often. Speak out, uh, listen to others. There's this feeling in this, um, there's, Many good people want to lead. And when they see a problem, they want to find a solution. They want to be the leader of it. And, and that's a good feeling for people to have, except for when it's not. And when it's not is when we need to recognize the time that we need to do more listening and that we may need to take direction rather than being the one taking the lead. Uh, none of us know everything, and there's a lot that we all have to learn. And with that, I think we also need to remember not to make assumptions. Uh, we also need to understand allyship and what that means. We have to think about, as Greek uh, men and women, and, and for those that are undergraduates on the call, we need to think about our programming. We need to think about the themes that we use. We need to think about our own actions and how they align or don't align with the values of our organization. I could probably talk for an hour about this, but I'll leave it just at that. Very good. I appreciate that. Uh, and then the final question that I have for our panelists here, what are your organizations doing to educate and aid and allyship for Black communities to fight racial injustice and to understand bias? Libby, what's happening at ZBT in those areas? Uh, Lawrence alluded to it earlier. Um, in 2016, we came together and started a program called Hate Against One is Hate Against All and really started working with um, educational opportunities to uh, combat hate on college campuses. We've had um, five summits against hate since then and are currently working on a virtual summit um, in, for the future. And um, those, those opportunities to bring people together, um, in those cases, they were targeted at um, higher education professionals and community professionals um, to bring those together and talk about the different communities and the different types of hate and how hate against one community is a hate against all of our communities and and really broadening that conversation and making sure people ha have an understanding of of where to begin the conversation how to act how to become active and and to make change um also within zbt 
Um, we, I am really excited that we have created some affinity spaces for our brothers. And so um, we've recently created an affinity space for our black brothers to come together and to be able to have that support and that opportunity for dialogue. Um, and um, it's it, from what I, I, I didn't participate in it because I didn't fall into that um, affinity, but um, for those that did participate in it, found great, um, I, I think a great experience and it's a, it's a stepping stone for them to create a larger um, community within a community. Um, we've also done a number of educational opportunities like, you know, talking about a program that words matter, helping people understand how to engage in dialogue and utilizing the right words and also just helping um, our students understand how to get their, our students and our alumni, all of our brothers get their, get their minds and get their hands around things that are going on in today's society. Um, and then we're also going to be having another program that talks about um, how to utilize activism and, and, and call upon your elected leaders for change. Um, and, and this all comes from just talking to our brothers and, and what do you want and what will be helpful and, and talking to our alumni about how can you help us, um, what talents can, can you share with others that can make a difference. So we're very, very lucky at DBT that we, we've been having dialogue for quite some time in this area, but again, we can still be doing more and we are doing. I love it. I love creating those spaces. I think that's great over at ZBT. Uh, Alyssa, what's happening at DFIE in terms of educating and aiding in allyship for Black communities to fight racial injustice and to understand bias? Yeah, um, you know, like Libby said, in meaningful conversations, um, you know, all, all of the board members' email inboxes are open, as well as um, Nicole Bisseo, our executive director, her email inbox is open as well. We want to be hearing stories. We want to be hearing requests from, you know, our members about what needs to change. Our Facebook group has been really active with conversation, which I think has been so beautiful to watch sisters from, you know, different chapters and different generations come together and start talking about what kinds of changes that they want to see. Um, we've also all been encouraging them to, you know, bring changes to us at Grand Chapter that's happening later this month. Um, of course, our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee is continuing to meet and evaluate what steps are organizations' responsibility to take on and also where can we leave room for sisters on the ground to make change. Um, similarly, all of our chapters have been reevaluating what their programming looks like and what their culture looks like. Um, I'm really proud of the women that I work with at the Delta Ada chapter who made changes about our programming schedule for this upcoming year without even asking, you know, myself and my co-advisor. They came to us and they said, you know, listen, we want to start to have movie screenings. We want to, to start to have these discussions about um, you know, racial injustice. We want to start having these discussions about implicit bias. Great, great, absolutely. Of course, I'm going to say yes to that. Um, and I think it's really beautiful that it's something that they wanted to see um, and that they knew would make a difference in their chapter. Um, I also am really proud of the fact that DFI has um, diverse women on our social media and um, on our websites, right? So if you log on to our website, if you go to DFI, um, on Instagram, you see women of all different races. And I think that is also really important to show that we are truly a space where anyone can be welcome. Um, and I would encourage any chapter and organization to, to Google their, their websites, look at their Instagram and um, just stop for a moment and look at what you see. And is that really reflective of the membership that you have? That's fantastic. Thank you so can much I, for sharing that. Yes, go ahead. Can I have one more thing. Um, when I was talking about our Summit Against Hate, I would be re remiss if I didn't talk about it. it's a great partnership between um, Alpha Epsilon Phi, Sigma Delta Tau, and Sigma Alpha Mu. Yes. Um, they are helping all of, we all come together to make that, uh, to conquer that, that tough conversation and, and, and going up that up that summit to to combat hate. And so, and I think like, this is another perfect example of how different groups come together to make a difference and like together we're better. And so I think that that, that is a key to everything in combating any negative experiences. Together we're stronger, together we're better. 
100% agreed. And thank you for making that clarification, because I think that's important to highlight that partnership that exists between these historically Jewish groups. I think that's fantastic. So now we have a really exciting part to the program. This is the reflective dialogue section of our program. And everybody's going to be a participant. Everybody who's here can actually speak and let their feelings be known through this tool. So essentially, in terms of reflective dialogue, what is it? It was developed by essential partners, and they were promoting what was called public conversa conversations project to take on controversial topics. And the topic that they were taking on at that particular time was race racism. So again, I think this is a great tool for people to use right now for some really difficult conversations. The purpose of this tool is to foster collective dialogue where conflicts may be driven by differences in identity, life experience, beliefs, and also with values. And the core of this session is, is that people who have different beliefs, have different experiences and perspectives, they all seek to develop a mutual understanding. So everybody here, all of the participants, will speak to be heard and also listen to others in order to understand other people's perspectives. Our goals with this reflective dialogue is acknowledgement, understanding, validation, narrative disruption, truth telling, relationship building, trust, and also healing as well as another big part of it. Now there is a communication agreement. So by moving forward into this reflective dialogue, there are certain ground rules that we have. Number one, when we speak, we speak for ourselves and we allow others to speak for themselves with no pressure to represent or explain an entire group. Okay, so when you speak, you're speaking on behalf of yourself. You're not making any representations on behalf of all Jewish people or an entire organization. It's just how you feel. Number two, we will not criticize the views of others or attempt to persuade them in any way. Number three, we will listen with resilience. And that means that sometimes we're going to have to hang in when something is hard for us to hear, right? So we're not always going to agree with all the opinions. Number four, we're going to share airtime and participate within the suggested time frames, which is basically two minutes that each person here, every participant, is going to have to answer these questions. Number five, we will not interrupt, except to indicate that we cannot or did not hear a speaker. So if for some reason the audio cuts out and you don't hear them, that's the only time we're going to interrupt anybody. Number six, we will pass or pass for now if we're not ready or willing to respond to a question. So if you can't respond or you're not willing to respond, it's okay to say pass or pass for now, and we can come back to you later. Number seven, we will hold in confidence what we hear in this circle. We're not going to confront one another about circle comments after we leave here. So whatever happens in the small group sessions, it's not, it's not being recorded at all. It's just something that's between the people in that particular circle. Number eight, we may go hard against ideas, ideologies, and institutions. We will not, however, harm or attack individuals within or beyond the circle that we're creating. And then number nine, we're not going to use any personal electronic devices during this confidential facilitated discussion. So it's just your feelings. So feel free to be open and honest about the ways that you are feeling. Now, we're going to do this now for the next half hour, um, these small group facilitated sessions. And if you, um, you have facilitators in every room, so there is going to be somebody that's going to prompt you for certain questions once you get in there. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to bring everybody back at 2.20 central time so that way we can do a wrap-up conclusion. So I'm going to send everybody into your rooms now and uh, enjoy. Welcome back, everybody. Hopefully that uh, reflective dialogue session was helpful for all of you. Um, and I thank you so much for participating in this event today. Uh, in total transparency, I've been thinking about this topic for a number of years now, and it really hasn't been until I started seeing a lot of evidence of racial injustice happening literally on a daily basis in this country. And I started thinking about my own Judaism and, uh, and my faith and some of the things that I need to be doing uh, in order to fight racial injustice in this country. And this topic just seemed to make total sense to me that we have a space to talk about these issues Think about how we can make our organizations a little bit more inclusive. Think about making sure that we have diverse chapters and that we're promoting people both locally and nationally uh, based on their qualifications, not based on their race, religion, or creed, or any of that. 
Um, so hopefully this was helpful for you. Um, I want to give a chance to our panelists, if they have any closing thoughts, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what they were thinking uh, as they went through this process of being a panelist and then seeing the small group breakout sessions. Uh, Libby, if you're still with us, what do you think about uh, this particular presentation and any closing thoughts that you might have? I think this has been a great opportunity for um, an outstanding dialogue and I'm just very thankful that you invited me to be a part of it and to share my story and the story of ZVT. Um, I think that this is just the beginning of what could be many more conversations and, um, and the people that were committed to come today to engage in this that says a lot about them and their organization. Um, and, you know, I, I enjoy the opportunity to, to, to cause myself to think and reflect, because oftentimes we get caught up in everything that we have to do, especially um, in the industry today. It's like you don't have a lot of time to look back because it's like there's other fires that are going on. Right. And to be able to come together with Alyssa and Alex and Lawrence and you, Mike, um, as well as all of our other guests here today, it's been a great experience. So I really appreciate it. I'm so happy that you feel that way. And uh, and certainly if there's other topics that you wanna tackle, please let me know. I'd be more than happy to host these types of conversations. If there's other angles that you wanna look at, whatever is helpful for you in terms of that reflection, which you do need to make time. I know how busy all of us are. I know we are constantly putting out fires, but we have to take the time to reflect and think about where we are today and what changes we need to make for a better tomorrow. Uh, Lawrence, what are your thoughts about about this, uh, this event today and what closing thoughts do you have for us? I'm also grateful to have been part of it, so thank you for the invitation. Um, it's so easy to read your Twitter feed or, your, or the news in the morning or whatever news source you use and to feel helpless and depressed and saddened. And those are all real feelings. Uh, I think there's a lot going on in our world that would cause all of us to, to feel that way in some shape. I also am reminded through conversations like this that there's a lot of reason to be hopeful. And there's a lot of reasons to celebrate the many people that are doing great work within our community, outside of our community, and the opportunity that our organizations have to bring in those great people uh, in the fall when recruitment um, officially launches on campuses in some way again. Um, I also am equally hopeful that while these discussions are great and I love being a part of them, what are we all going to do to act on them? Because talk is super cheap. Uh, so what can we do to take the discussion that we've had today, each of us, and who are we gonna tell about it? And what are the action steps that we're gonna think about? And what do we hope the impact will be as a result? As much as I love seeing all of these faces and having all of these conversations, if nothing happens as a result, then it was just a nice feel good type of a time that um, we need to find more ways to act. And I appreciate being part of it. Thank you so much for saying that. And I completely agree with you. We have to get into action. I will definitely email everybody here a recording so that way they can watch it, share it with other people in your network. And that's really why I designed that final question that we had within the small groups to start thinking about what are you going to do in order to make a difference. And I think all of us have to really start thinking about that and how we turn this productive conversation into action in the weeks ahead. Um, Alex, what do you think about uh, this particular event and what uh, final thoughts do you have for us as we wrap up? Um, I just really appreciate the um, invitation to come and to participate. Um, I think that this topic, um, I am very, I have a unique perspective on um, seeing as how I joined the Jewish fraternity and I'm a black man who doesn't really affiliate with any religion. Um, I think that I just like to talk about how great my fraternity has been to me. Um, they've really been able to empower me to feel like I can make a change, um, you know, in the world. Uh, there wasn't, it wasn't long ago that um, this very same thing were happening with the protests and with the racial tensions. Um, I would have just kind of shrugged and been like, well, you know, you can't change the world. Um, but I have a very different viewpoint now, and it's because of ZBT that I feel empowered that, you know, I know that an individual really can make a difference, um, not just in people's lives, but in, you know, in the world at large. And so, 
that, that's mostly it. Just, I love my fraternity. Uh, it's done a lot for me. <laughs> that's a very powerful testimonial, Alex. You have no idea uh, how strong your words are and uh, how they resonate with me because I also feel that I'm better off because of my affiliation with my fraternity. There was a lot of skills that I got in terms of leadership skills and motivation skills and communication skills to go out and speak in front of 4,000 students at a time. And none of that is possible without the leadership experience that I had in my local chapter, just like you did at the University of Memphis. So those words resonate with me and I thank you so much uh, for those words and sharing that with us. And thank you so much to everybody who participated here today. Um, I will email you a link to uh, the video. If you have any additional thoughts, feel free to reply to that email, um, or you can just email me directly, bookings at greekuniversity.org. I'd love to talk a little bit more about this particular event and what other events you wanna host in the future, what other topics you would like to tackle. I would be more than happy to help facilitate that for you. So thank you so much for being a part of this great program today. And I look forward to hearing from you in the near future. Have a spectacular rest of the day. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.